I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation. And I want to talk today about some work uh, that was done, is being carried out uh, by uh, Aritra Santra, who, who's with me at Monash University. And uh, he's co-supervised by Professor Burkhard Dunwick, who's at the Max Planck Institute uh, for Polymer Research in Mines. So you're perhaps aware that associated uh, polymer solutions are really polymers with uh, what we call sticky groups, or groups along the backbone that are capable of attracting each other. So um, because of this, you can have what are called intra-chain associations. So these groups attract each other and kind of stick together, form bonds. And one denotes by P1 the fraction of the sticky monomers that are stuck by intra-chain interactions. I'll use this notation. So the fraction of all those that are stuck through interchain are called P1. You could also have interchain associations. So sticky groups on different polymers can stick together. And um, the fraction of those, of all the stickers that are present in your system, we denote by P2. Okay? So because of these associations, um, you tend to form clusters. So you begin with micelles, and then you form larger clusters. Uh, and as you increase the concentration, these groups stick together uh, to form networks. So at a particular concentration, you can get a system spanning network that's usually called the gel phase, and all the remaining finite size clusters belong to what's called the sol phase. And this transition from going from no um, gel to gel is called the sol-gel transition. Right? So uh, what is really useful about these systems is that you can delicately tune their properties. So for instance, you could change the number of stickers you have on a chain. You can change the distance between them. Uh, you can change the strength of attraction between these individual stickers. You can change the concentration of your solutions and the temperature. And this control actually allows you to get a range of properties. And, it, and that's the reason why you have uh, associated polymer solutions being used in a wide range of applications that are listed here, some of them. And in fact, the rheology is fundamentally affected by the microscopic structure. So, and that is the reason why um, it's of real interest to understand how does the microscopic topology and these intermolecular interactions, how do they control the flow behavior of these associating polymer solutions? And the hope is if one day you can really understand how microstructure controls macroscopic properties, then we could actually rationally design uh, these systems for predictive uh, properties in a wide range of applications. And what our goal is to try to develop a mesoscopic uh, Brownian dynamic simulation algorithm that um, can give us insight into what the uh, underlying physics is. And, uh, and I'm uh, hoping with uh, Gareth McKinley to do some carefully uh, designed experiments to test our theories. Okay, so, but before I come to rheology, um, I'm going to be talking about equilibrium. And in fact, oh, my entire talk today is going to be on the equilibrium behavior of these solutions because we first need to understand the equilibrium behavior before we can understand rheology. And there are two options or two things that we can do. One is to compare with scaling theories for the systems, and the other is to compare with experiments for associating polymer solutions. So um, the advantage of comparing with scaling theories is that one can really understand how these intra-chain and inter-chain conversions uh, are dependent on your system parameters. Uh, what is the temperature and concentration uh, at the onset of gelation, and, and, and something about the shape of the phase diagram, and, and on dynamic properties, how do they depend on concentration and so on. And also a really useful aspect of comparing with scaling solution, uh, theories is we can tease out what are the universal features of these associative uh, polymer solutions. And I think once we have these in place, we can go ahead and compare with experiments. Right. So um, the scaling theory I'm going to discuss, um, in fact, there are in many, but there are these seminal papers uh, by Semenov and Rubinstein um, almost uh, 20 years ago, um, and then more recently, relatively more recently by Dubrinin for uh, sticky polymer solutions. And essentially what they do is they use a lattice theory to derive an expression for the free energy. They include both intra-chain and inter-chain interactions. And for simplicity, for their theory, they only allow association in pairs. In other words, if two sticky groups stick together, a third one cannot come and stick to it. And for simplicity, we, or, or for in order to compare, we impose the same restriction on our simulations. 
And what they argue is that you can write the partition function as a, a product of three different contributions. One, because you have mixed the polymer and solvent together. Another, because of polymer solvent interactions and polymer polymer interactions. Both these, of course, occur in Flory theories as well, mean field theories. The new addition is here a partition function due to the formation of these intra and intermolecular uh, association bonds. Okay. Um, I want to point out one important factor that's going to play a role later on um, is that if you imagine you have a homopolymer in a solution, then you're aware there's a theta temperature below which it's a poor solvent and above which you have good solvent conditions. Just the fact that you've added stickers to your chains actually makes it a poor solvent because you have induced attraction between parts of your chain. And so you effectively um, get an increase in your theta temperature. However, as far as the scaling theories are concerned, they're only worried about the backbone monomer solvent quality. So in all the theoretical predictions, they do not um, directly treat the fact that your theta temperature is raised. So, and obviously then they consider two possibilities. One where your, theta sol uh, your solvent is a theta solvent for the backbone, and another where the solvent is a good solvent for the backbone, okay? Um, now, in order to explain the scaling theories, I have to give you a little bit of background and notation um, so that I can set the stage to explain what their predictions are. The first is this idea that Dijin introduced that in a dilute solution, your polymer chain breaks up into a sequence of blobs, and this is to account for the dependence on temperature on your uh, polymer. And the idea is that Every uh, pair of monomers repel each other because of excluded volume interactions, but if the energy is not enough, if it's less than KBT, you need to accumulate a certain number of monomers before the energy becomes of order KBT, and that's the length scale of a blob. So it's only when you have KBT energy that these blobs exclude each other, and so the idea is that you have GT monomers that have to, uh, their combined energy is of order KBT, and therefore, you'll have N over GT if N is the total number of monomers. That's the number of thermal blobs. And this allows you to come to a lot of simple scaling uh, predictions for the size of the chain and so on. I'm introducing this because in the scaling theories for associating polymer solutions, they use these ideas, right? Um, now, the advantage of these thermal blobs, it helps you to understand the crossover behavior from a theta solvent to a good solvent. And the variable one normally uses is something called Z. This is the solvent quality. It depends both on the temperature and the molecular weight. In the thermal blob ansatz, you understand it as the ratio of the ideal chain to the size of a thermal blob. And you'll see uh, how, one, how this is helpful. Imagine uh, that your thermal blob is gradually growing in size, right? And that means psi t is growing, which means you need more and more monomers for their energy to add up to KBT. So you reach a stage where the thermal blob is larger than the size of the chain as a whole. And that means the whole chain at the thermal blob doesn't have energy equal to KBT, so just random thermal fluctuations are enough to randomize your chain, and you just, this is the so-called theta solution limit, and your chain obeys random walk statistics. And this is where it's an ideal chain. On the other hand, imagine that your thermal blob is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. You need less monomers to get KBT energy. And so, in other words, Z is becoming larger. And until finally, the thermal blob is the size of a monomer. And the entire chain then excludes itself. And then you have self-avoiding walk statistics. Uh, and this is where you follow the Flory scaling. So, this variable Z is very convenient to understand the crossover all the way from uh, theta to good. Now, you might ask, how does that help us? In the dilute solution case, it actually helps you understand the existence of universal behavior. So imagine you have two different polymer solvent systems, completely different polymers, completely different solvents, but on a large length scale, if they have the same solvent quality, in other words, the ratio of the chain size to the thermal blob size is the same, then you can argue that they will swell the same amount relative to the theta temperature. So this is size at some temperature above the theta temperature as a function of solvent quality, and you see all the data has collapsed on top of each other, uh, and this swelling can be understood through the notion of these thermal blobs. And I'll come back to this um, later, but the other blob that uh, one needs to understand is the so-called correlation blob that arises in the context of semi-dilute uh, polymer solutions. So it's generally understood that 
um, in, in polymer solutions, you have the dilute and concentrated limit, but there's also a very important intermediate regime called the semi-dilute regime, because even though your monomer concentration is small, you can have polymers interacting with each other because they're extended objects. And it begins at what's called the uh, overlap concentration C star, when the chains are just beginning to touch each other. And in this regime, uh, Dijon introduced the notion of a correlation blob, where he argued um, that on length scales below the correlation blob, a segment on a polymer chain doesn't know there are other chains in the system. And so within a correlation blob, the polymer segment behaves as if it's in a dilute solution. On the other hand, on length scales larger than the correlation blob, you have chain chain interactions, and, and then it behaves like a concentrated solution or a melt. So the semi-dilute solution, uh, he reduced this problem to one of dilute within a blob and concentrated on length scales larger than a blob. And um, I won't go into the details, but um, things like hydrodynamic interactions and explorer volume interactions are screened on the length scales of the blob because they don't exist in concentrated solutions. And you only have them in, uh, in dilute solutions. What we need to take away is that the length of the chain within a correlation blob is called GC in my notation, and the number of uh, correlation blobs would be N over GC, okay, with the size given by size C. So that's the um, general background. Now, in general, of course, you are not in a dilute solution, nor are you in a solution where you have only self-avoiding walk statistics. You are in what's called the double crossover regime where you are somewhere between theta and good in, as far as temperature is concerned, and your concentration is somewhere between dilute and concentrated. In that case, you will have both blobs playing a role, and the solution physics is then a delicate interplay between these thermal blobs and, and correlation blobs. So this is the uh, background uh, that was in, uh, invoked by Dobrynin and Rovenstein in their scaling theories. Now, before I give you their uh, main results, Here's some notation. So um, I'm going to denote by L the number of monomers between stickers. So that's called the spacer length, you know, how many monomers you, you have between two stickers. I'll denote by F the number of stickers on a chain. So if you count in this example, there are about seven of them. And of course, n is the number of monomers, right? And as before, um, I defined p1 as the degree of intra-chain uh, conversion and, and p2 as the degree of interchain conversion. If you add them together, we denote that by p. So p is the fraction of all the stickers that are stuck. Okay. So um, let's consider the first scenario they said, that, namely that you have a theta solution uh, and the other was, of course, that you have a good solvent. So when you have a theta solution or random work chain statistics, this can happen under two circumstances. One is the solvent can be a theta temperature for the backbone, right? Uh, this is independent of what your concentration is. If you are at the theta temperature, then the backbone is experiencing, uh, um, uh, behaving like a random work. And um, the other uh, possibility is if your, your correlation blob becomes smaller than your thermal blob because you have random box statistics inside a um, thermal blob and outside a correlation blob. But if your correlation blob gets smaller than the thermal blob, then you have random box chain statistics on all length scales. Um, this requires you to go um, to a pretty high concentrations. And um, we, are, we haven't got there yet in our simulations, but I will show you um, results for the, the first scenario. Okay, uh, and then, um, so here are um, their predictions, uh, the scaling predictions. And I'm going to indicate in blue either stuff I cannot simulate or what I am not simulating at the moment, but I can uh, in the future. So the first is it, uh, their theory is a lattice theory. Uh, and so they have terms in there that depend on the geometry of the lattice. And since our simulations are going to be in free space, I, I, say I won't be able to simulate these and it's not of interest to us. On the other hand, um, they have terms that depend on the strength of the stickers. And for the moment, our simulations are at constant sticker strength. So I, I can't explore the dependence on these terms. Um, what we are changing is the spacer length between two stickers. Uh, we're changing the concentration. And I'll show you, we'll also change the number of stickers on the chain. So here are their predictions. The first one is this is the degree of intramolecular interaction um, conversion. And you can see it's independent of concentration. It's a constant. 
It only depends on this uh, spacer length. The intermolecular uh, uh, degree of conversion um, scales linearly with the concentration. And so you can see these are very simple um, testable predictions of the scaling theory, if you can uh, set up the simulations. And here is a ratio of these uh, intramolecular to the intermolecular uh, degree of sticking. And you notice that this, in fact, seems to be independent of the sticker strength, because it's the same functionality in both. But that's not something I can test. But I can test uh, the, the remainder. OK, now let's look at the second scenario where um, you have a good solvent for the backbone of the chain. And this is where all these blob arguments uh, are invoked. So we've got two regimes in this. The first is where your thermal blob size is smaller than the spacer length, but the spacer is smaller than the size of the correlation blob. Right? So here it, it is in pictorially. So here are your correlation blobs. These red uh, dots are the stickers. So you see the distance between stickers is larger than the size of a thermal blob, but it's smaller than the size of a correlation blob, which is this volume as a whole, right? Then you have the second scenario where your um, spacer length is larger than both the thermal blob size and the correlation blob size. So you can see that the sticker distance is larger than thermal blob and the correlation blob. And in each of these cases, they come up with predictions for the intra-chain and inter-chain degree of conversion. Now, one thing you need to notice is in order to form a bond between two stickers, you need to bring two thermal blobs together. Okay? So then the question becomes, what is the probability of bringing two segments in a good solvent together? And it turns out this problem was actually addressed by De Clouseau in the 1980, uh, in 1980 uh, using renormalization group theory. Now, we're all familiar with the end-to-end -end vector probability distribution, right, and the Flory exponent nu. However, he pointed out there are other probabilities, such as what's the probability of an end with an interior segment, and what is the probability of two interior segments coming into contact with each other. And for this case, he introduced a new exponent called theta 2, right? So this is the probability in a good solvent that two segments come within a distance of delta of each other, where here r is just the end-to-end -end distance between the monomers that are separated by, uh, the segments that are separated by n monomers. Now, he predicted a value of 0.78 for this uh, exponent theta 2. Dobrinin, by doing, um, just for consistency reasons within his uh, scaling argument, said it ought to be a third. Okay, so this is a big difference between uh, De Closo's prediction and Dobrinin's argument. And so we, simulations will give us an idea which is the right one. Okay, so with this uh, background, here are the predictions in regime one. This is where the spacer length lies between thermal blob size and correlation blob. Now, um, you notice that this expression involves the size of a thermal blob, but there's no correlation blob here, which means, again, this is independent of concentration the intra-chain degree of conversion. The inter-chain degree of conversion depends on concentration through this correlation blob. And if you put in the dependence, you can actually work out that this is the dependence on the spacer length and the concentration. Now, I must also say, uh, you'll notice there's a temperature dependence here. And we are now doing our simulations at a constant temperature. And therefore, I can't test this. But I would like to uh, test that in the future. And this, of course, is the ratio of these two. You get a similar set of uh, predictions in this regime two. Okay? Um, and no, here, of course, this becomes a function of concentration because the correlation blob appears here. Now, I will show you that we can actually calculate in our simulations what is the size of our thermal blob and correlation blob. And we're actually um, in the previous regime, uh, sorry, uh, in this regime. And I don't have results for this one yet. Okay, but, uh, but we do have in the previous regime. So um, before I present our results, one other point I want to make is this notion of the gel point, right? Uh, so that's the point when you go from the salt to the gel phase. What, the point that Dobrinin makes is that it's impossible to locate the gel point within their mean field theory because the mean field theory, the lattice theory, doesn't dif distinguish between the salt phase and the gel phase. And so what he suggests is that we just borrow 
um, the dependence of this intra inter uh, chain degree of conversion on the number of stickers that was derived a long time ago by uh, Flory and Stockmeyer. They assumed, you know, by, that the Bete, um, the network is a Bete lattice and there are no closed loops. On the other hand, um, Semenov and Rubinstein made the following point. They said, if we assume that the maximum, or rather the gel point coincides with the maximum in the free chain concentration. So you have chains that are not associated with any other chain or with the network. And they claim that if you look at the maxima in this, the maxima will occur at the gel point. Because once you cross the gel point, any new free chain you add to it goes and joins the network. If you believe that, then you can actually derive this, right? Uh, dependence of intra-chain on the number of stickers. So if you stick this function into this expression here, they get the expression for what they call the gel line. So um, just ignore the blue for the moment, but this is telling you how does the temperature depend on concentration and other system parameters when you're going from the sol phase to the gel phase. And because I can't um, simulate these at the moment, or I'm not, I can only test this part of the uh, prediction. However, is this true, right? Um, one of them um, argues that you have to accept a certain definition of the gel point before you can define this, and the other says you simply can't get this at all from a lattice theory. So we can test if that is true. And the other is, what is the real signature of the sol gel transition? I'll come to that later, but there are a number of different ways of identifying what the sol gel transition is. Okay. So um, here's now, I'm not going to give a lot of detail about the simulations because I've talked about them before, but here's a to-do list. If we wanted to do these simulations, you'd have to describe a system of chains that are interacting with excluded volume and hydrodynamic interactions. You have to be able to describe both theta and good solvents for the backbone. Um, you need to map out the temperature and concentration crossover for all the static and dynamic properties. And finally, you need to be able to simulate the sticking of stickers in pairs where you should be able to vary the number of stickers, the spacer length, and the strength, and so on. Okay? So um, that's what we've done. We have essentially used periodic boundary conditions and simulated the chains in a box. And so you can calculate what's the concentration and what's the overlap concentration and so on. And we've carried out Brownian dynamic simulations. Um, and in the important new uh, feature in our simulations that we've introduced is the use of this so-called Sodom and Dunweg Kramer potential, which was introduced into the literature um, some years ago. It's essentially the same as the Leonard Jones potential for the repulsive part, which we are all familiar with, which is here. But they essentially replace the attractive part of the potential with a cosine function. The advantage of doing this is it always truncates at the same point, no matter what your well depth is. And so you can vary the degree of stickiness just by changing the depth of the well, which plays the role of temperature, right? And after this, there is uh, no potential at all. So um, this allows you uh, to vary the depth without changing the range at the same time, which is a problem with the Rana Jones potential. And we can use the same potential for both stickers and the backbone just by changing the well depth. One is stickier than, uh, stickier than the other, okay? So the question then you would want to ask is, what is my value of epsilon in a theta solution? Because you know for a theta solution, you have a delicate balance between attractive and repulsive forces. So the way we do this is the following. You know that at the theta point, the size of the chain scales linearly, uh, uh, squared scales linearly with the number of uh, backbone, uh, uh, beads. Right? And so if you divide this by uh, the number, you get a constant, uh, which is really just the monomer size squared. So if we plot in our simulations the size divided by the number of monomers um, versus this well depth epsilon, you know that at the theta point you should get the same value for all different chain sizes. And that's exactly what we get. There's a unique point at which no matter what your size is, you will scale as square root of n the size. And that is how we identify the theta point, epsilon theta. And an interesting thing is that this Dunweg potential is able to reproduce the swelling I showed you earlier, the universal swelling for dilute solutions. If, because the epsilon is taking the role of temperature, if you define your solvent quality in this way, um, you can then show that um, the predictions of this potential collapse on a master plot. Okay, so let's now uh, address the issue um, that once you put stickers on your chain, you actually raise the theta temperature. 
So you have to think of this problem in the following three dimensional space, right? So you've got the spacer length is one coordinate, the distance between your stickers. The other is how um, repulsive is the backbone relative to your theta temperature. Right? So, we denote by 0 uh, where you have complete repulsion between the backbone and 1 is when the backbone is, is the same um, epsilon as a theta uh, depth. And the other is how sticky is your sticker relative to the theta condition for the backbone. So, you can see that you basically need to lie below the surface if you want to be in a good solvent. So, this as you keep adding uh, stickers, right? you uh, change your theta temperature and this is the surface that we want to be able to identify. If you are above this, you are in a poor solvent. Okay? So, uh, how do we find this um, theta surface? Well, you have to essentially repeat what we just did. That is, uh, do the same psi squared over n minus 1 versus the um, well depth of the sticker as a function for different uh, chain lengths and you find a unique intersection point. So, this tells you if you have a sticker with this well depth of 4.18 and your backbone solvent quality uh, was 0.3, um, then um, you will be under theta conditions. right? Um, and But what we found two interesting consequences of this. One is that this Rg squared over n, essentially the monomer size, didn't depend on whether you had a sticker or not. So, the homo polymer had the same constant value as a sticky polymer. And in fact, if you now defined a renormalized solvent quality, where this was how you defined it when you didn't have stickers, but now if you add these terms, then your sticky polymers collapse on the universal behavior of homo polymers. In other words, sticky polymers are also universal as long as you scale them suitably. Right? The big advantage is if I wanted to find this theta surface, you would imagine I'd have to do a whole number of simulations for different backbone uh, solvent qualities and different uh, you know, uh, simulations in order to keep on identifying this point. But with this universality, what it implies is you only have to do a single simulation. You keep your sticker strength at some fixed value, your backbone depth at a certain value, you will predict a swelling and from this universal uh, curve, you can back out what is my theta depth for that uh, sticker. Okay? So, um, we, this is what we needed to, to do our simulations. So, let me begin by giving our results. So, here are for intra-chain uh, association, what we call P1. Now, um, I, I pointed out earlier that my, I'm using a completely repulsive backbone. So, my thermal blob is literally the size of a monomer. And because we are in the range of 1 to 2 C over C star, we have roughly two correlation blobs. So, half the chain is sitting inside a correlation blob. So, I am in this regime of good solvent behavior where my spacer length is between thermal blob and correlation blob. Now, the nice thing is this is the prediction by scaling theory. And if I, um, in fact, use nu is a half for a theta solution and theta 2 equal to 0, I recover the prediction for a theta solvent. And if I um, use 3 fifth for the Flory exponent, and now it turns out we need to use theta 2 as a one third, which was the Dobrinian prediction and not 0.78, which was the de Closo calculation. And then you see it all collapses on a constant. Our simulations for a whole range of chain lengths, spacer lengths, number of stickers and so on. Now, in the theta solvent, I want to distinguish two cases. One is where I have used this 0.45 theta depth, which I pointed out. In that case, this constant is the same as for a good solvent because that data lies on this. The other simulation we did was to make the chains ghost chains. So, the theta condition for the backbone was obtained by not having any potential at all. And if you do that, you get a different constant, but it's still a constant. Okay. So, this is certainly validated uh, and I had, I pointed out of course, we are doing it constant sticker temperature, uh, strength and temperature. Here now are the interchain associations, okay, um, where you can have sticky groups um, connecting uh, from different chains with each other. Again, um, there is a common scaling expression for theta and good solvents and if I use the appropriate values for nu and theta 2. Um, you can predict that in a theta solvent, your slope should be 1 and in a good solvent, it should be 1.25. Uh, 
and, and sure enough, you see, um, this is 1.25 for a good solvent. These slopes of one are for the two theta cases that we have considered, uh, one with the well depth of 0.45 and the other with ghost chains, okay? Um, and finally, um, here is the ratio of the intra and interchain conversion. Um, and of course, again, if you work out these exponents, it turns out that theta should be one um, and this should be 1.25. Uh, and, and so the scaling has minus of those values and, and here again uh, you get data, data collapse, okay? Uh, which shows you that these scaling theories are astonishingly, uh, uh, you know, successful in predicting this behavior. Okay, but then the more importantly for practical uh, applications, um, you want to know something about the sol gel transition. Now, uh, and I want to um, point out that there are a number of different ways people have uh, addressed this issue of the sol gel transition. Uh, one common understanding of when the gel, uh, when a gel occurs is that you have a system spanning network, that your network completely occupies the entire um, uh, space, right? And um, so if I had ideal conditions and I'm pl pl uh, plotting the probability of getting a system spanning network versus concentration, ideally it would be zero probability until you came to the uh, concentration at which you have percolation essentially and then you get uh, the occurrence of a gel network. But of course, in your simulations, you have a dependence on the fact that you have a finite size box, right? And so there's a finite probability that you span the system even though you're not at that percolation threshold and there's a finite probability that you have some sol even though you're above it. And so you get a dependence um, like this, but if you do your simulations for different box sizes, they intersect at a unique point that's independent of box size. And that tells you this is the uh, concentration at which you have a system spanning uh, cluster. And what's interesting here is you see you, um, this is for different chain lengths and they all uh, give you roughly the same value of the concentration at which you have a system spanning cluster, okay? So um, we denote that as um, gel transition one or definition one, this idea of a system spanning cluster. Then um, the other, uh, notion that's used in literature quite often is to look at the bimodality of the of a probability distribution. What do I mean by that? So they ask, what's the probability that you have a chain of uh, m clusters? Uh, oh, sorry, a cluster of m chains. Said the other. So um, as m gets larger, your probability is going to decrease. You're not unlikely to see a cluster with a very large number of chains. Unless you've gone beyond the sol gel transition, then you begin to see clusters with a large number of chains in them. And so your probability distribution from being monotonically decreasing becomes bimodal and you see a second peak appearing. So people have said, well, when the first inflection point appears in your probability distribution, that's the location of the sol gel transition. And so we'll denote that by sol gel transition two. Right? And finally, um, to this uh, argument that Rubinstein and Semenow made is what is the free chain concentration and um, the location of its maxima is where you have a sol gel transition. Oh, the point I wanted to make here is that you will find this one is different from the first one and finally this one we call um, uh, transition three and this is the maxima in this uh, free chain concentration and you notice this is happening around 0.5, which is quite different from the spanning probability uh, prediction which was around 0.38, right? And uh, you can also find what is the concentration of chains in the sol phase, in all the chains, not only the free chains which have not associated with any other. And that also has a maxima which is again different from what you see here, okay? So let's now go back to this idea of the gel line. And you remember this was the prediction uh, of the scaling theory when, uh, so, uh, uh, so this was the prediction of the degree of interchain uh, sticking. And what Dobrinin and Rubinstein somehow suggested was you need to substitute this uh, dependence on the number of stickers in here and then you get an expression for the gel line, which I showed you earlier. But we don't know if this is true. Uh, and secondly, we'd like to actually investigate what is the dependence on the spacer length and the number of stickers of this. And because this total fraction of conversion, you know, total number of stickers that have, uh, fraction of stickers that have stuck appears here, we also want to probe what is the dependence on the spacer length and number of stickers, okay? So if you do that, it turns out that the um, inter 
molecular degree of conversion is independent of spacer length at the gel point. So we have located the gel point, and by the way, each of these different colors represent gel point identified in the three different ways. So that's the spanning property, that's the bimodal, and this one is the free chain maximum. All of them uh, predict that this uh, degree of intermolecular conversion is independent of spacer length. But more importantly, this dependence on f is not 1 over f minus 1, but 1 over square root of f minus 1. So this is a very important result because this is what leads to the gel line. And, and our simulations are suggesting it's not going as 1 over f minus 1, but rather 1 over square root of f minus 1. And similarly, if you look at this total conversion, right, uh, and this is the expression that appears in the scaling expression, 1 over 1 minus p squared. Again, this is independent of the number of stickers for large enough chains, but it scales linearly, or, or 1 over 1 minus p squared goes as 1 over L in terms of the uh, spacer length. So if I come back to my, so these are the two important results that we found from our simulations. If I come back to the scaling prediction and I put in here that 1 minus uh, p the whole squared goes as L, and that p2 goes as 1 over square root of f minus 1, this should be the concentration at the gel point and how it scales uh, with this number of stickers, okay, with these exponents. And, you s and, and if you work out all the, um, the, the value, it should be 0 0.8. And you see our simulations are in fact suggesting that at the gel point, you scale with the number of stickers with this power law of 0 0.8. So, uh, I mean, once we do simulations with temperature dependence and sticker strength in there, we can explore the entire uh, gel line and the phase diagram, okay? Uh, I want to point out just a couple of uh, more slides. Um, so, uh, you remember we were doing um, uh, simulations with the backbone uh, as a theta solvent. Now, if you look at the phase diagram for associating polymer solutions, you can imagine we're somewhere in regime one, okay? That is, it's a theta solvent for the backbone, but once you put stickers on it, it's become a poor solvent. And it's there in regime one, and now if I gradually increase the concentration, I'm going to get phase separation at some point because I'm going to get into this two-phase region. And sure enough, if, and so here's a snapshot from our simulations. This is the prediction of the scaling theory, and we're following the prediction until we reach a certain concentration, and then the prediction goes haywire, right? And this is for um, two different cases, and in this inset, we're looking at C over C star, just to give you an idea of where we are, so it's around one here. And you see, you get phase separation, because you've gone uh, from region one into this uh, envelope. On the other hand, uh, if you were in a good solvent, that is, we made our backbone purely repulsive, you obey scaling all along, you never see any phase separation, and the simulation suggests your system is homogeneous all the time. And in the terms of the phase diagram, you're up here going along uh, in this direction because we are doing constant temperature. Okay? So, uh, I don't know how I'm for time. Well, I'm concluding. <laughs> um, so, we've looked at simulation results for static properties, and they're in good agreement uh, with the predictions of scaling theories. However, uh, not with a decloso exponent of 0.78, but rather with a third. And um, C over C star at the solgen transition depends on how you define the gel point, uh, but it's independent of chain length. Uh, and rather than following the 1 over F minus 1 flory stockmeyer uh, theory, the uh, interchain degree of conversion seems to follow 1 over square root of F minus 1. And you will get phase separation with increasing concentration. <laughs> Uh, when the backbone of a sticky polymer is under theta solvent conditions. Thank you. Ron. Yeah, that's beautiful work. Um, do you have an idea why you get the um, 1 over the square root of f minus 1? Is it because of in is it because of um, internal sticker to sticker, the, the chain? Well, so uh, the it, original it looks... theory uh, is on a Betty lattice where you have no closed loops. So the theory doesn't account for the fact that you can have closed loops within your, so your branches never form closed loops. 
And that's the foundation of the 1 over f minus 1, which is not in assimilations, obviously. But uh, beyond saying that that is not true, I haven't really uh, given thought of why it's square root, and I'd love to talk to you about that. Uh, from a scaling point of view, uh, that's not been predicted. Mm -hmm. People haven't looked at it. Other questions? Can you um, talk about uh, prospects for connection to um, experiment? And so you have um, predictions for P1 and P2. So are there labeling techniques that one could think about to account pairwise interactions? Yeah, so I came across uh, a paper in Biophysics Journal um, where they're actually staining macromolecules and looking at in situ formation of the gel with fluorescent markers, and they're actually able to identify these junction points. So I'm, uh, I'm trying to tempt uh, Charles Schroeder, this, it's interesting and it's worth looking at. So maybe that is a way uh, to actually get uh, an idea of what these uh -huh. P1 and okay. P2s are. But, uh, Good. Other questions? 